Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I've got something a bit different for you. Being the time of year that it is, I thought it would be nice if we went through the origins of the seasonal festivities. But then I thought it would be too much of an attack on Christianity, so instead I'm going to read the Jesus origin story found in the Bible. So without further ado, we will start with the account found in the book of Matthew. Starting with chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, he <laughs> came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Well, there's the first problem with it. Cause if, if he was a righteous man, you would think he would follow the, uh, the Mosaic law, where in uh, Deuteronomy 22, verse 20, they found that um, if a young woman was not a virgin on the wedding night, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house, and there the men of her town shall stone her to death. She has done an outrageous thing in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house. You must purge the evil from among you. So if Joseph was a righteous man, uh, no righteous man would automatically assume that his wife saying, oh yeah, ghost did it, is actually going to be the case. Uh, they would probably have stoned her to death. So Joseph was not following the Mosaic Law, although um, it, it does make it pretty easy for a man to divorce a woman, but the wording that's used there suggests that the reason for divorce would be something less than adultery. So uh, Mary was very clearly an adulterer, if unless you believe her wild tale of being impregnated by a ghost. All right, continuing on with verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now hang on a second. If I follow that little amendment down. It says that that comes from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. So let's see. Uh, now, if this is accurate, it should come exactly word for word from that verse. It should say, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. So let's go. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Well, that's uh, that's not exactly a word-for-word -word rendition, so it's not entirely accurate here. Um, but of course, the Bible's 100% accurate all the time. But even giving them the benefit of the doubt here, and saying that you know the the differences are just due to translational errors or scribal whatever, who knows, whatever, who cares? The differences are fairly minor. But read Isaiah 7 in context. Uh, let's start with verse 13. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and your people uh, uh, and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. So basically, that's a prophecy about a guy who's going to come to defeat the king of Assyria after the Lord, I guess, brings Assyria into uh, Israel. Um, I, I don't know. I haven't read the whole chapter. I might be wrong on that, but it's obviously not referring to Jesus. I mean, Jesus was supposed to have been the perfect human being, no sins ever, which means there was no before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, like it says in verse 16 of Isaiah 7. Uh, he just always would have known to choose the right. There wouldn't have been a before. Um, unless you're willing to concede that there was a time when Jesus did not know right from wrong. I mean, the Son of God, God in human form, did not know right from wrong, if, if Isaiah 7 is about him. So clearly, that was just kind of shoehorned in there to make it seem like they were fulfilling some sort of Old Testament prophecy. 
Oh, yes. And did I mention that this is the only time in the entire New Testament, like this verse is the only verse in the entire New Testament that actually refers to Jesus as Emmanuel? Nowhere else in the Bible does it call Jesus Emmanuel. I mean, there's, of course, the references in the Old Testament to Emmanuel with regards to those prophecies, which if you consider them to be about Jesus, you could say that that's them calling Jesus Emmanuel. But uh, if you read those prophecies in context, almost none of them are about anything like some sort of Messiah figure like what we have with Jesus. Um, and in the New Testament, there just is no other verse that calls Jesus Emmanuel. That's it. Just this one. Matthew, Matthew one twenty three, only verse in the Bible which calls Jesus Emmanuel. And continuing on from verse 24, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now this nitpick here only really applies if you're a Catholic and you refer to the Virgin Mary and you consider Mary to have been a virgin for her entire life. Uh, that makes it pretty clear that Joseph did indeed know her in the biblical sense after she gave birth to Jesus. I mean, it says right there, he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. So I guess like immediately afterwards before she's done bleeding or whatever. Yeah, he'd, he'd be pretty horny by then, I would think. That's gross. Chapter 2, The Visit of the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Okay, this is, this is actually the verse that started my journey into atheism right there. The uh, verse 2. Uh, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. The Magi were from the east. If they saw his star in the eastern end of the sky, they would have been going the wrong direction to get to Jesus. So that's that's a bit of a biblical error right there. Now I guess I guess it could be interpreted to be they like while they were in the east. Is it, remember, they if they're seeing a star in the east, they're going to be walking east. But if they are in the east, they have to walk west to get to where Jesus is. Uh, now I guess you could interpret that to mean like, and this was my little apologetic for it uh, that kept me going for a few more years was that um, the Magi themselves were in the East and it was when they were in the East that they saw the star and the star told them to go West or whatever. But it, you know, it, if you read it, it's, it's kind of hard to believe that way. So it, this is, this made Christ Christmas a really hard time of year for me when I was a uh, starting to doubt my beliefs Christian. And uh, that verse is precisely why, because pretty much every Christmas, uh, church service quotes it. I would also like to point out at this point that there were two King Herods that ruled uh, at one point or another around this era in Judea. Uh, the King Herod that's referred to in the in the story of Jesus' birth was Herod the Great, who uh, he could have died anywhere from uh, 4 BCE to 1 CE. There are various reasons for these datings, but his uh, his sons all dated their rules from you know, like when his kingdom was split up, and they date their rules to 4 BCE. So that's the most likely date, but there is some evidence to suggest that it could have been 1 CE. But anyways, the the latest that King Herod the Great referred to in the story of Jesus' birth could have died is... Uh, 1 CE, the year 1. So keep that in mind when I go to the next account in Luke. But now on with the story. Verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And uh, the little superscript there is telling me that that's from Micah 5.2. So let's go to Micah, shall we? Just check up on these uh, little sources here. Okay. And uh, just just for the, for the record, when I'm going back to the uh, previous... Uh, ver verses. I am reading the same version of the Bible that I'm reading the story of Christ out of. Um, I'm, I'm using the New International Version. I know some people don't like the NIV, but you know what? 
it's the it's it's the Bible that I had on hand, you know, for the first time in a long time today, I found myself thinking, where is my Bible and actually wanting to know the answer to it. Um, but anyways, so Micah 5 2 NIV. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, as I'm reading the notes on this, is it, uh, this isn't Bethlehem the city. This is Bethlehem Ephratah. That's that's a clan. Though you are small am lo among the clans of Judah. It's it's actually it's the clan of Bethlehem who was the son of Caleb's second wife. Caleb's second wife was Ephrath Ephrathah. Sorry, these these names are tripping me up. I I don't speak Hebrew. My apologies. But um anyways, it it obviously doesn't refer to Jesus for this. It's uh it's like if if you read the whole the whole chapter, it's actually uh verse 5 6 makes it clear that the uh, the leader is supposed to defeat the Assyrians um, which you know I don't I don't think Jesus ever defeated any As Assyrians but um but anyways let's go back to uh, verse verse 6 is who will rule the land of Assyria with the sword the land of Nimrod with drawn sword he will deliver us from Assyrians when they invade our land and march across our borders that's still talking about the same person that was referred to in Micah 5 verse 2 um, if you don't believe me, you can go read the whole chapter. I guarantee you I'm not wrong on this. Um, I don't recall Jesus ever defeating any Assyrians, so that that prophecy just could not have been about Jesus. And it either shows that they that whoever authored Matthew was making up a story and trying to make it fit as best he could to the scriptures that they had already combined with the stories that they had of Jesus already, or he was just flat out making shit up. Anyway, on to verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now, obviously, that's not a star. If it's moving around in the sky, how do you, I know people say, "Oh, God's miraculous! He can do anything." Stars are fucking massive. They are a lot bigger than Earth. The smallest star. Well, okay, no, I guess there are. Um, is it a neutron star? The neutron stars are the ones that are about the size of a city. So maybe it's a neutron star came and but no, this is hovering over a specific house. But we'll just ignore this particular little absurdity for the sake of getting on with the story here. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, notice house, not manger behind the inn, when they came to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So, yeah, apparently Jesus was not born in a manger behind an inn because there was no room in the inn for them that were coming for the... Anyways, I'll, I'll get into that with the next version. Verse 13, the escape to Egypt. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. Where he, uh, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord have said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. And that is from Hosea 11.1. 1. Let's go read that, shall we? All right, Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Hmm. I wonder why they left out the first half of that verse from the little reference there. Could it possibly be because then it makes it obvious that they're referring back to uh, the story of the Exodus from Egypt? I mean, it, the more you read Hosea chapter 11, the more obvious it is that they're they're talking about the Exodus. They're not talking. That's not even a prophecy. That's just going back to, uh, oh, God loves Israel. Remember back when he freed us from Egypt, even though, you know, like after he freed them to Egypt, they freed them from Egypt. They you know, they sacrificed to bales, they burned incense to images. And, you know, it, it just keeps on going. Basically, that whole chapter is, hey, 
Remember when I took Israel out of Egypt? That's because I loved them. Even though they were being terrible to me, I still saved them. So clearly not a messianic prophecy. So, so far, if you're keeping track at home, we are zero for three in messianic prophecies. Okay, on from verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Keep that in mind. This story is happening. The Magi visited Jesus when he was two years old. After he was two, they fled to Egypt, and we'll be getting to what they do after Egypt in just a moment. Also, I think it'd be good to note here that had King Herod actually gone on a rampaging massacre, killing all boys two years old and under in a particular region, that would have been documented in some sort of Roman history. Uh, I mean, Josephus, who documented Herod's life pretty well, like in great detail, didn't mention it. In fact, this book of the Bible is the only book in history ever discovered to have suggested that there was a slaughter of children um, in the town of Bethlehem around the birth of Jesus. Uh, seems to me that it's just more of drawing parallels to the story of Moses and how he came about. So he's, you know, that, that was a common theme throughout uh, scriptures at the time uh, when they were being penned. They would rework old stories into the new stories in ways such as that. So it makes perfect sense that they'd just be borrowing from a previous legend doesn't make sense that it would be an actual historical event. All right, so verse 17. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So that is from Jeremiah 31, 15. So let's go read it in Jeremiah. It says, This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning in great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. That's the first time a verse has been even close to being an identical quote. Um, the only thing it's missing is the this is what the Lord says at the beginning. So that good on you for copying that one down correctly. But, uh, you know, if you continue reading to verse 16 and 17, it goes on uh, again. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your descendants, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. Land. So after doing a little bit of research on my fancy schmancy internet that certainly wasn't available to the author of Matthew, so there was no way he could have really, well, I mean, I guess he knew that scripture. He could have just read the next two verses. Um, and even if he didn't know it was about the Babylonian captivity, he could have just gathered from context that it was about one of the Jewish captivity, one of the times when there was a foreign nation ruling over Israel. Um, but yeah, that verse is specifically about the Babylonian captivity. It has nothing to do with the coming Messiah. So again, we are, we are now 0 for 4 on the Messiah prophecies. Verse 19, the return to Nazareth. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of, of Galilee. Side note, Galilee was at the time being ruled by Herod's other son, Antipas. So if, you know, being a son of Herod is something to be afraid of, Galilee is not really much better than uh, Bethlehem. But anyways, I guess he was looking to go back to Bethlehem, which kind of suggests that he was from Bethlehem originally, which you know, we'll get into that with the next version of the story. And he went to live in a town called Nazareth, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. There's no reference for that one, because nowhere in the Old Testament does it ever say that the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. It's just not there. I mean, some people have taken this to mean is uh, Nazareth was supposedly a very looked down upon town. Like people would snub Nazareth. And be, oh, no good can come from Nazareth. Um, so one of the verses I think in Isaiah was saying that um, he'll be of lowly birth. He will come from a low place. He'll be despised. So that that means he's from Nazareth. So they say that's what that's referring to. But there there's no reference for that in the actual Bible itself. That's just speculation, really. Um, but anyways, that's... 
that's it for the story in Matthew. I could go on and do the John the Baptist thing because there's more prophecies that fail in that one. It's so much fun. But um, yeah, anyways, it's time to get on to the version found in Luke. All right, the book of Luke. Now, I'm going to read the introduction in chapter one just because I find it fascinating. This is a verse that I had never, 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 ever seen quoted in church. I had kind of skimmed over it myself when I was a Christian, but I, you know, you just kind of skim past it. There's nothing really important in it. Well, there is, but there's nothing important to the Christian narrative in it. Um, so anyways, Luke 1 verse 1, introduction. Many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So that introduction right there. Any Christians out there, if you think that all the Gospels were written by the people whose names are at the top of the Gospel, right there. This is not written by an eyewitness. This is not an eyewitness account. It says so right in it. This is a guy compiling the list of accounts and putting together his own account based on these other accounts. And he's writing specifically to a person named Theophilus, who uh, I guess he's this guy's friend or something. He's trying to tell him the story all over again. But... Anyway, I just I th I find that to be absolutely fascinating, especially uh, considering how much people hold on to the idea that the Gospels were written by the people whose names are attached to them, and they were written by eyewitnesses. It's eyewitness testimony. This is not eyewitness testimony. This is hearsay. But on to the reason for the season, Chapter 2, The Birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. Okay, that makes no sense. You see, the census of Quirinius started in the year 6 CE. The last story we read had Jesus born in the time of King Herod the Great, who died at the latest in 1 CE, five years before the census took place. Also, nobody was required by the census to travel to the town of their distant ancestor. You just participated where you were. So the census really wouldn't have affected them in that way. So it seems like there's been a lot of retconning going on to make the story fit. This is actually, in my opinion, the strongest evidence to, to suggest that Jesus was a real person. Both Matthew and Luke agree that he was known as a Nazarene, but all the scriptures they were interpreting as being messianic mentioned him being from Bethlehem. So they each went well out of their way to find a way to make Jesus the Nazarene be born in Bethlehem. So one person came up with this completely ridiculous census, and the other rehashed the Moses origin story to have them flee to Egypt and then move to Nazareth. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them at the inn. Even though in the last story they had a house in Bethlehem, and they were living in the house when he was born, and... You know, that just... that makes no sense. And again, you know, Joseph is from Nazareth, and he goes to the town of his ancient, ancient ancestor, David, to register for a census. How would that even work? What are the logistics behind that? Like, it, it, how, how do they know that nobody's going to the wrong city to register? I don't even know where my great-grandfather lived. My grandfather, I could find his place. I, I kind of have a vague idea of where my family is from, roughly in Scotland. Yes, I'm Scottish by ancestry. Um, but I, I, I can't tell you the name of the town. My dad can, and I could find out from him easily enough, but, um, I don't, like, that's, that's only going back a couple of generations. 14 generations or whatever it happens to be between David and Jesus. I actually no, I think it's 28 because I, th I think it's 14 from uh, David to the exile in Babylon and then another 14 from the Babylonian exile to when Jesus is born. So that's 28 generations. 
Can any of you tell me the name of your grandfather 28 generations ago? Any of them. I mean, I know there will be a lot of grandfathers back then, but any of them. Name me one of them and tell me for sure. Like, trace me the line, the genealogy. Give me the genealogy. Was Joseph such an important person that they had his whole genealogy written out already? Like, I know that both genealogies in the Bible don't agree with each other. There's only like two names in common. Like, seriously, it, it's ridiculous. And even even if Joseph was of an important enough family that he did know his whole genealogy all the way back to King David, do you really think a census would require everyone to go back to the towns of their ancient ancestors to by, based on what house they're from? If they like. Record keeping back then was terrible. The average Joe probably couldn't tell you his great grandfather's name. I can't tell you my great grandfather's name. Verse 8 The Shepherds and the Angels. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. You know, because the Lord is so comforting. I mean, up until this point in the Bible, he had been pretty genocidal maniac at this point. Like, if the Lord or an angel showed up, you were either about to see a bunch of people get killed, or you were about to get killed, generally. So I can understand being terrified at that. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph. That, that must seem easy. What were, what were they doing? Were they going past every single barn and stable that had a manger? Saying, Excuse me, are there people back there? Excuse me. Oh, there are people back there. Do you guys have a baby? No, you're just stable hands. Okay, let's on to the next one. Were they doing that all night long? We worship you, O Brian, who are the Lord over us all. Praise unto you, Brian, and to the Lord our Father. Amen. You do a lot of this, then? What? This praising. No, 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 no. Uh, well, um, if you drop in by again, do pop in. <laughs> and thanks a lot for the gold and frankincense. Uh, but don't worry too much about the myrrh next time, all right? <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Well, weren't they nice? <laughs> Out of the bloody mines, but still. Look at that! <laughs> here! Here! Here, that's, that's mine! Hey, you could aim me that! Oh. Like, just, just picture that. It's not like they just walked somewhere and boom, there they were. Unless you put this together and you have the star being over the manger when the Magi visited, which, you know, that's, that's often what's portrayed. But remember, the Magi didn't show up until uh, Jesus was two years old. And this is immediately after his birth. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the Jesus presented in the temple section yet where Jesus is eight days old. So this is the night he was born, most likely. Then the Magi didn't show up till two years later, so there was no star to guide them. These guys were wandering through a fairly large city for the time, checking mangers for babies. They, they must have seemed incredibly sane. So yeah, that was verse 16. So, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. This sounds like a conspiracy theorist wet dream, to run around proclaiming something crazy like this. I saw a bunch of angels up in the sky, and they told me there'd be a baby wrapped in clothes in a manger, and I found a baby wrapped in clothes in a manger. And to have people actually go, wow, that's amazing, with no evidence, that's conspiracy nutjobs wet dream right there. Verse 19, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. Verse 21, Jesus presented in the temple. I'm going to skip most of this section. I just want to make it clear here that this is on the eighth day. It was time to circumcise him. He named him Jesus. The angels given him before he had... Uh, oh yeah, the name the angels gave him before he was conceived. And then... 
verse 22, when the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Okay, so after the time of purification, if you go back to Leviticus 12, uh, verses 1 through uh, 8 are the rules of purification after childbirth. Uh, so for a male son, as opposed to a female son, I guess, uh, the woman will be ceremonial un ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. Now, for reasons unknown to me, if you give birth to a daughter, you're dirty for twice as long, because, you know, gender equality and all that in the Bible. Uh, but we're not worried about that right now. We're just looking at, okay, so this is 33 days plus the 8 days, so this is uh, 41 days. 41 days old is Jesus at this point when they take him to the temple. And uh, go down to verse 49, or sorry, verse 39. Chapter 2, verse 39 of Luke. This is just after they've been to the temple for his 41st day consecration thing. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So, Jesus was less than two months old when they went back to Nazareth. According to the other version, he was two years old before they even left Bethlehem. They were in Bethlehem long enough that they had a house. There was no manger. He was two years old when they left Bethlehem to go to Egypt, and then he didn't come back to Nazareth until after King Herod died, which could have been another couple years. Who knows? It, like, if, he, if Herod died in 1 CE, maybe Jesus was born in 4 BCE, spent two years under uh, King Herod's reign without Herod knowing about it, fled to Egypt, spent another three years in Egypt, and he didn't get back to Nazareth till he's five. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just speculating here. But the point is, these two stories do not even come close to adding up. And this is, this is beyond the whole multiple witnesses to the same event are reporting different things thing. This is, this is just completely out of whack. So they're two options here, basically. Um, there, there might be more that I'm not seeing, but essentially it comes down to either the Bible got the story wrong in one book or the other, or the story just didn't happen, and it was just put together later to fit other stories that were growing around this Jesus character. I don't know which it was. Personally, I don't care. It's just, it's obvious that this is not the same story. It's completely different. They can't go together. They often get mashed together for Christmas specials on TV or whatever. Um, but it, you read them back to back. It's just very, very obvious that it just it doesn't work. Anyways, that's it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed making it. Uh, next week, it will be back to a bit of orange. Won't that be fun? I don't know. I'm I'm actually enjoying the Bit of Orange series. I hope you guys are too. Uh, let me know down below if you want me to you know, cut it cut it off early. The guy's got something like 17 videos in his series, so I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get through the whole thing or not. So if you're enjoying the Bit of Orange series from me, let me know and I'll keep up with it. If you're not enjoying it, let me know and if you know, I might cut it off early or you know, if it's if opinions divided pretty well down the middle, I'll do less of it at least and you know maybe alternate episodes instead of doing it all at once. So uh, yeah, and uh, remember to follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon. See you next time.